go ahead and begin with prayer. I'm going to keep turning on this down. Man. That is hot still. Sorry, Ryan. It just seems to be really alive or something. Okay, because, yeah, that's better. Thanks. Well, let's go ahead and pray, all right? Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to study again tonight. We ask your blessing on our time together. May we rightly divide the word of truth to be able to understand the thought of the author, the Apostle Paul, and particularly you, Lord, as you've revealed your word. So bless us tonight as we continue in this amazing letter of the New Testament. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, uh, I just want to say that next Wednesday we will not be meeting. The reason is because I will be in South Carolina. So um, I'm, I'm leaving Wednesday morning and uh, we'll be, I'll be back. My meetings are done Friday afternoon. It's just a three-day type thing. So... Um, I'm driving down Tuesday night to Rachel and Tim's, staying there, and then 7 in the morning we go. So, <laughs> yeah, we're just talking here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, we won't meet next Wednesday, and I'm sorry about that. All right, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Now, I'm just going to go right to... Uh, Right to this right here. We're in the second, you know, section of this letter, if I could call it that. I don't know if the Apostle Paul thought in sections. I'm just saying a righteousness from God uh, provided, okay? We saw it needed, provided. We're working our way down. We're just going to jump right in to the bottom section, um, this section here. I just want to get into this. That's why I'm jumping right in, okay? Look at the, the paragraph there. In this passage, I know we did this last week, but this is a kind of a tough situation here. In this passage, Paul explores the contrast between two Adams, the first man, Adam, of Genesis 1 to 3, and the last Adam, Jesus Christ, of 1 Corinthians 15, 45. He's called that. In the last Adam in that passage. Now, uh, I want to read the NIV study Bible footnote at verse 14. Notice verse 14. It says, um, nevertheless, death. No, why do I have that written down there? Oh, yeah. Because, because these two are parallel. They're patterns. You'll see what I mean. Verse 14. Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. Now, in what sense, in what way was Adam a pattern of the one to come, the last Adam? Well, the NIV footnote has a great note here. It says, Adam, by his sin, brought universal ruin on the human race. In this act, he is the prototype of Christ who through one righteous act brought universal blessing. The analogy is one of contrast, not comparison, but contrast. So that's what we're getting at here. Notice the next sentence. Adam introduced sin and death into the world. Christ brought righteousness and life. Adam, by his sin, brought universal ruin on, the, on humanity. Jesus Christ, through one righteous act, brought universal blessing. These two men, and this is important, these two men summarize, sum up the message of the book up to this point. They summarize this section, a righteousness from God needed, and this section, that we're in now, a righteousness of God provided. So he's summarizing the, what he said so far in this paragraph. Okay? The passage is challenging, and so we're going to boil it all down, make things quite simple the best we can. The passage focuses on two acts of these two men. 
That's how you, that's how you understand it. Let's read verses 12 through 14. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man. Oh, let me go over here. Sin entered the world through one man. And notice that now. Sin entered the world. Where did sin actually begin? Huh? Yeah, where though? In heaven. That's right. That's where it, it Sin entered the world through Adam, but it did not begin there. It began in heaven. All right. And death as a result of sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. Now, how do we know that death came to all men? You know, God gave Adam a distinct commandment, right? And then... And then until the time of the Mosaic law, there were not too many other commandments, okay, until the time of the law. So that's the point here. He says, how do we know all sinned in Adam? Here's, here's how. For before the law was given, when was the law given? At Mount Sinai, 1446 B.C. Before the law was given, Sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. In other words, people were not given a direct command from God, a revelation from God. They had conscience. So there is, there is a sense in which the Lord in his forbearance and mercy and patience, because there was no clear direction and commandment like Adam had, right? You may eat of all the trees in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. He had a clear direction from God. But from that time until the law of Moses, humanity did not. So the, but how do we know they still sinned in Adam? They were still sinners. Well, it says, verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command. See the argument there? Um, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. All right. So we see the condemning act of Adam in these verses. Sin entered the world through um, Adam's, yeah, through Adam. Adam's sin has been and as a result, Adam's sin has been imputed to us collectively. Now, that's a, that's a teaching that comes right out of this, this particular verse. That we sin, we are guilty of Adam's sin. We sin in Adam. That's why, even though people didn't have a command, um, that's why death reigned. And Adam's sinful nature has also been passed down onto us individually. From parent to child. And not only did sin enter into the world through one man, but death into the, came into the world. Death reigned. By the way, that's going to be a big concept. Three times in this passage, verse 14, verse 17, we see it again. For if the trespass of the one man, through the, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned. And then also in verse 21, just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness. So they are, the concept of reigning, ruling, dominating, death reigned. Adam was not originally subject to death, but through sin, it became a grim certainty for him and his posterity. Death is essentially, what is death? Death is separation. That is, the, that is what death is. Separation. And when you think of death, there are three distinct manifestations or types of death. Three ways that in our relationship to God, we've died in Adam. First of all, the most, the very first thing, the the, the moment that Adam and Eve ate that fruit, what God told them not to eat, they died. Now, 
I know that Adam didn't die physically. He lived how long? 930 years. 930 years. So he had, he had another hundred, I mean, uh, nine centuries plus 30 years. So he didn't die physically. But he died. And we know he died because spiritual death, because the, immediately what happened afterwards, he was hiding from God. He hid in the trees. They hid. And people have been hiding ever since and running. And also he was afraid because he, was, he knew he was naked. He was aware, self-aware, and he was afraid. He was exposed, and he was afraid, and he hid. And not only that, but then, we, then it was never anyone's fault, <laughs> right? It was, Adam blamed his wife? No. Yeah, is that the, is that, I forget who, which one went. But anyway, then they, yeah, they just blamed each other, yeah. And so people have been blaming each other, husbands and blaming wives, wives blame husbands. If, uh, if they were, this person was better, if this person was better, if they'd stop that, you know, you know, we just go on and on. We blame. It's never our fault. Never, never our fault. So that's a sad reality of spiritual death. They were separated from God. Secondly, there's physical death. As I said, Adam, it took him a long time to die physically, but he did. At 930 years. And then thirdly, there's eternal death. This is called, well, there's eternal death. When, when unbelievers die, when those that do not know the Lord have not been born again, when they die, they go to Hades. That's Sheol in the Old Testament. And it's not a pleasant place. Luke 16 tells about a man named Lazarus and uh, the rich man. Remember that? And um, so uh, the rich man was in, in Hades and he was tormented in this flame. And he asked for uh, Abraham to just dip his finger in water and touch his lips. And then he was concerned for his family. I have, I don't want him to come to this place. And he said, they have, they have um, Moses. Yeah, Moses and the prophets. If they won't listen to them, they have the word of God. They won't listen to them. They won't listen if someone rose from the dead. So this guy never got to talk to his family, his five brothers. But the point is this, that is a place, Hades is a place where the unsaved dead go to wait the final judgment and eternal sentence in the lake of fire. And that's Revelation 20, verse 15, Revelation 21, verse 8. Um, that's the great white throne judgment. That is the final judgment that the damned are waiting for. And, and then to be cast into the eternal lake of fire to join the devil, to join the Antichrist, the false prophet. And, um, and that is described, particularly in Revelation. It's called the second death. So, this is not pleasant. Death into the world. But, you know, we can deny it and say, oh, I'm not going to believe that because I can't live with that every day. Well, you can do that. But it, the reality is it is what it is, and it's a fact. It doesn't change it. You can live, not you, but a person can live in their ignorance and their denial because I don't want to hear that for their measly 30, 40, 50, 60 years that they have left. But to compare to time and eternity, it's nothing. And uh, so this is a pretty horrible thing. Well, but then in contrast to that, Adam, we have 
the redemptive act of Christ. And this is verses 15 through 21. Now, there's no way to overcome the fall of Adam except through Christ. There is no way to handle the damage done by Adam's fall except through God's grace. Look at verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. Praise the Lord, right? The gift of God is not like the trespass of Adam. Yeah. Uh, God's abundance, God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness resulting in justification is so much greater. And here's why. Where sin increased, what happened? Grace increased all the more. So before we look at that, I want us to go to, I put on the back of your paper, the, I put this chart that I got from the Bible Knowledge Commentary to help us under, to help us see the point, because it is, it is a little bit of a challenging passage. So look at the chart as we read through this. It's verse 15 through 21, the redemptive act of, act of Christ. The gift is li not like the trespass. It's so much better. Okay. So here we go. Let's read verse 15 and then look at the, look at the two contrasts there. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died, many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So notice your chart. One man's trespass resulted in or led to many dying. In fact, all. <laughs> but on the other hand, one, the, the other man, Christ, the last Adam, one man's uh, grace led to or resulted in the gift of grace, which is, by the way, righteousness, overflowing to many. So Paul's making that contrast there. The gift is not like the trespass. Now look at verse 16. Again, so he's kind of repeating. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. So one man's sin, that is Adam's sin, resulted in judgment and condemnation. Next column, many trespasses led to the gift which brought about justification. In other words, the gift followed many trespasses. Verse 17. For if by the for if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the, through the one man, Jesus Christ. So here's the contrast. Through one man's trespass, that resulted in death reigning. Death reigned. But through one man, Jesus Christ, that led to believers reigning in life. Verse 18. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. So, once again, one trespass resulted in condemnation for all men. One act of righteousness led to justification that brings life that has been offered to all men. I added a few words there. Uh, kind of smooth it out a bit. Verse 19. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. So disobedience of one led to many um, constituted sinners. The obedience of one led to many, resulting in many being made righteous. 
think that's what he meant to say. There being many being made righteous. And one more. Look at verse 20. The, now notice this. The law was added. Remember what he said in verse uh, 14? Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command. Remember that? Well, now he says, the law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's the last comparison. Sin reigned in death. Grace reigns through righteousness to bring eternal life. So that's, that's the contrast going on here. And that's the summary of chapter 1, verse 18, up to this point. Now, you know, I picked this up, this statement. The fact is that, listen, sin is a bigger disaster than we think it is. Who talks about sin anymore? What preachers talk about sin anymore? You don't hear it from politicians. You know, um, I think I read in Jerry Bridges' book that the last time a president of the United States used the word sin was Dwight Eisenhower. But the fact is that sin is a bigger disaster than we really think, than we think it is. It's a massive disaster. We live with it every day. And grace is more amazing than we seem to be able to grasp that it is. Sin is a bigger disaster than we think it is. And grace is more amazing than we seem to be able to grasp that it is. And that's, that's really kind of like the point the Apostle Paul's making here. All right, we've kind of beat that to death. <laughs> Okay, so let's, let's move on. Oh, well, yeah. And then as you look down there, grace takes, grace, God's grace takes many forms. God's grace takes many forms, and there are many facets to God's grace. Here's, here's some of them. First of all, we think of God's grace, we think, that we think of the grace of forgiveness, don't we? The grace of forgiveness. Um, that's amazing. It's amazing to think that in Christ, all my sins of the past, all my sins of the present, all my sins of the future have been fully and completely covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not have to work to excuse or pay for what I have done. I do not have to soothe my conscience with rationalizations. I do not have to ease my guilt with arguments for my own righteousness and defend myself. I do not have to try to make myself feel better about what I have done by blaming someone else. No, I can stand before God just as I am without fear because in Jesus Christ, I am fully and completely forgiven. He paid it all. That's hard for people to get. Even many Christians Perhaps it will take an eternity for us to understand the extent of grace we have been given and the significance of the forgiveness that flows from that grace. And, and because when we think about this grace of forgiveness, uh, it has some ramifications in our lives. It's transformational, point one. This grace of forgiveness and understanding it and grasping what we have in Christ, it is transformational. When you grasp how much you need it, and when by God's grace you reach out and receive it, it changes you forever. No other force in this life compares to forgiveness in its power to change the way you live. The Apostle Paul could not get over. He says, I was a blasphemer. I was... I was a violent man. But the grace of God, the mercy of God. You know, the grace of forgiveness is transformational. Uh, be, uh, secondly, 
the, gr the grace of forgiveness, it mobilizes you and me. What do you, see, what do you mean mobilize it? And the minute you grasp the magnitude of the forgiveness you have been given, you want others to experience it. You want others to know the Lord. You want the people around you to know the personal rest and hope that only forgiveness provides. And the grace of forgiveness, it makes you want to obey. Forgiveness draws your heart in love and thankfulness to God. You want to live a thank you life. And in your love for him, you desire to think and do and say things that are pleasing to him. When you grasp the grace of God that, and what you have, it's transformational, it mobilizes you, it makes you want to obey. Second type of grace, the grace of enablement. Sin not only leaves us guilty, it leaves us unable. It cripples our ability to be what we're supposed to be and do what we're supposed to do. That is why we need the grace of enablement, the grace of power. We need power. That power does not come through some impersonal force. It doesn't come through enhanced personal strength. The power that God gives me and you is not a thing. It, God gives me a person. A person. To provide for me the strength I need to live in the way he's designed me to live, God gives me the only thing that can truly help me. He gives me himself. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live by faith, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And, and the reality is that God will never assign us a task without giving the grace to accomplish it. He animates, he strengthens me with his presence so I can say no to sin and yes to the call of his word. That's the grace of enablement. And thirdly, there's the grace of deliverance. The grace of deliverance. And what I mean by that is he's, he's not going to rest from his work of grace until every last microbe of sin has been completely eradicated from every last cell of every last one of his children. There will be a day when you're going to be invited to one funeral you will actually want to attend. This funeral won't bring grief to your heart or tears to your eyes. This funeral will make you sing and celebrate. There will be a day when you will attend the funeral of sin. And will, sin will die and you will live forever permanently freed from the tyranny of sin and its penalty. You will be glorified. grace of deliverance, right? So, man, <laughs> I'm telling you, this is really powerful stuff. So, so thankful for God's word. Now, let's go over now to, um, let's go over now to this next section. And here we go with this right here. Now we come to the third section. And that is the righteousness of God. Uh, applied the righteousness of God applied we've looked at the, a righteousness of God needed a righteousness of God provided now a righteousness of God ap applied how is a Christian able to live a holy life that's the question how is a Christian able to live a holy life point number one the power of the gospel does not end, stop, cease. It doesn't stop, cease, end when we're justified, right? The power of the gospel doesn't cease when we get saved. Getting saved is not the end. It's the beginning. It doesn't stop there. Paul said to the Philippians, and this is a well-known passage, but he said this to them. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers, for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the very first day until now. 
He says, I always pray with joy also because I'm confident of this. That he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So that's what we're talking up here, about here. A righteousness from God applied in our lives after we get saved. Chapter 6, 7, and 8 is after we get saved. How to live a holy life. Now, let me give you, let me give you this diagram again, when we, when, what we're talking about here. That little chart there is, you know, this is your life before you, you were saved. Right here. You were slaves to sin. I was too. That's how I was born. I was not only guilty of Adam's sin, but I, I also was, sin was passed down to me. I was a sinner. Slaves to sin. Then we got saved. Okay, we were converted. We believed the gospel. And now we're growing in holiness. This is, this is, until this point, this is our death or the rapture. Okay? So this is our, where we're all at right now, right here. And we're growing in holiness. So we're slaves to sin. We get saved. We're growing in holiness. But then someday, perfect holiness. So let me give you the three uh, stages, if I could call them stages, um, of sanctification. Because that's what we're talking about here. When we talk about holiness, uh, pursuing holiness, we're talking about the concept, the Bible word, sanctification. Okay, so three stages. There's positional sanctification. Yeah, I know you can't write that all. Just write positional. So here's the, here, here we go. It begins at salvation. When we get saved, um, we are justified, we're declared righteous, and we are positionally sanctified. We are holy because we're not holy, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been put to our account, right? So the way before God, we are holy people. We're called saints, aren't we? That comes from the word. I'm going to show you this in just a minute. The word holiness, um, sanctification, sanctify, saint, all come from the same word. So this is positional sanctification. We are holy people. But then as, so that's positional. The second uh, blank there is progressive. So holiness begins at salvation, or sanctification does. Sanctification continues throughout the Christian life, and this is what we call progressive sanctification, and that is putting off the old self and putting on the new self. That's putting off the thought patterns and the thinking, all the baggage and the habits and the patterns in our lives that are displeasing to God. And the ways we used to talk and how we used to think and how we used to get angry so easy and how we used to be dependent on, uh, you know, whatever substance or maybe it was, you know, uh, things we shouldn't be watching, you know, whatever. It's all this kind of stuff. Maybe it's worry, worry, worry. Maybe it's we just lived in fear all the time. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, we begin to grow in in other words, we begin to grow practically in our lives to match what we are in our position, right? We begin to grow. That's the Christian life. And notice the rocky road here. <laughs> it's not always smooth, is it? No. Sometimes, it, sometimes the rockiness looks a lot worse than that. It's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're, I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying it's not a straight a straight shot up. It's um, sometimes it takes a while before we start to go up in a positive, growing way. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons for that, but people 
you know, they just, um, well, I won't get into that. But then the third one is this. You can write in, so the second blank is progressive, and that's, by the way, Romans 6, 7, and 8. And then there's perfected sanctification, perfected. And that's when we will be, we will be actually made holy. We'll be glorified. And, the, and then that, it is complete. Sanctification is completed at death for our souls and at his return for our bodies. Glorification or perfected sanctification. We will be holy in actual fact. Okay, so this is, but we're, but we're focused now in this one right here. That's what Romans 6, 7, and 8 is about. How can a Christian live a holy life? And let me just say this. You know, when we think of the gospel, the gospel is actually, let's see. Yeah, it's about progressive sanctification. How is the Christian able to live a holy life? The concern is how does the law fit into all this? What's its purpose and role in progressive sanctification? Um, the gospel is actually a message, right? It's a very simple message. You ought to be able to say the gospel in ten words. Christ died for our sins and rose again from, wait, and rose from the dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kathy went through the same training as I did. <laughs> okay, and rose from the dead. Right. But the, the gospel is spelled out very clearly in 1 Corinthians 15. The focus on the substitutionary death of Christ and his resurrection. But the gospel in its widest scope includes the entire work of Christ in his historic life, death, and resurrection for us and his present work in us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ and his work for us and in us saves us not only from the penalty of our sin, but also from its dominion and reigning power in our lives so that we can become like Jesus and we can grow and change and move forward in being more like him. Sanctification is the progressive work of God and, and man. It's a joint venture. It's a divine human cooperative that makes us more and more free from sin and sinful patterns. And like Christ in our actual lives, we become in our practice what we are positionally. We're saints. I don't always live like it, but I should. And I need to grow. So, the subject in Romans 6, 7, and 8, God's plan of salvation doesn't stop with justification. It continues, and God has made provision for our holiness, for our sanctification. And that's what we're getting into in Romans chapter 6. So, here's what we're going to be doing. In Romans chapter 6, um, there are some things we need to understand, and that is our new relationship to sin. We are free from sin's tyranny by virtue of of our union with Christ in his death and resurrection. We need to understand our new relationship as believers to sin. In chapter 7, we must understand our new relationship to the law, to the law. We are free from the law's condemnation. We're not under the law. And, and lastly, we must understand our new relationship to the Holy Spirit. Our body is his temple. We live life now in the power of the spirit. To be led by the spirit means to walk in righteous paths by the spirit's strength. The Christian is led, motivated, enabled to walk in God's ways by the spirit rather than to walk in the flesh. So that's what we need to understand, and this is these are tremendous three chapters, okay? So let's uh, begin, well, let's go to number four. The teaching of Romans 6, 7, and 8 comes out of, oh yeah, it comes out of, let me get to my, I don't want to say here.
comes out of verses um, chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. What did Paul say there? He said, the law was added so that the trespass might increase. By the way, how do you think Jewish Christians in Rome, and there's a lot with regard to Jews in this letter to the Romans, and Gentile relationship, and just Jews and Gentiles, there's a lot. There must have been a huge population of Jews in Rome, Jewish Christians. How do you think they would react to that statement? The law was added so that the trespass might increase. They might not be too happy with that statement. We're going to, and, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that, just as sin reigned in death, right? From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, and then it increased even from the time of Moses on. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Now, now you've got to understand something here. Point number five, by the way, on your notes. Is everyone following me? Or point number five. Does Paul's gospel justification by grace through faith alone, does it disparage the law and encourage sinful living? But that's, that is what Paul is dealing with here in Romans 6, 7, and 8. Because what's the first verse of Romans 6? Yikes. See how people's minds are going? That's what he's dealing with. And so aren't we. That, that idea is, does Paul's gospel, justification, justification by grace through faith alone, both disparage the law and encourage sinful living? This twisted thinking appears in the question for, in question form in chapter 6, verse 1. Paul's answer is an emphatic denial, and it extends over chapters 6, 7, and 8. So he begins with a vehement, passionate rejection of the notion that God's grace gives us license to sin. He says, by no means. He then proceeds to explain that God's grace not only forgives sins, but also delivers us from sinning. Grace does more than justify, it also sanctifies. And we need to understand as Christians our new relationship to sin, our new relationship to the law, our new relationship to the Holy Spirit. That's chapter 6, 7, and 8. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm racing here. I'm trying to make some traction tonight. <laughs> okay, the teaching of Romans 6, 7, and 8 comes out of Romans 5. Oh, yeah. Both statements in 520 would have sounded shocking, even radical in Jewish ears. The first statement appeared to blame sin on the law, right? He said the law was added so that the trespass might increase. So that statement uh, appeared to blame sin on the law. And the second statement to minimize sin by magnifying grace. To minimize sin. By magnifying grace. In other words, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that's where, I'm sorry, I didn't finish that. That's where it seems, it could be read as disparaging the law and encouraging sinful living. Because the more we sin, what happens? The more grace we get. Hey, God's grace covers it, man. You know, I mean, I mean, <laughs> this is, yeah, and, I, and I'm just telling you, I've had people tell me that as a pastor. I had a man justify adultery. God, look, God's grace is, God's grace just, grace is so wonderful that even though I've done this, I know that God's grace has covered it. I mean, it has, but he wasn't talking about repentance and dealing with it. He was just saying, hey, 
I know it's not good, but God's grace is greater. Yeah. And using grace as an excuse for indulging his flesh. Well, well, yeah, th there's a lot of people that don't believe in the judgment seat of Christ. A lot of Christians. In fact, when I, I'll just say, when I've preached on that subject in the, in the church here, I've had people, you know, really, they don't like that concept. That believe, Why would believers be judged? We're forgiven. They don't like the concept of the judgment seat of Christ. But the Bible teaches it. Not to determine whether we're going to heaven or hell, but I have been given a gift. I've been saved. And I am going to, I am going to give an answer to my Lord for what I did with his grace and his mercy in my life. And there's going to be rewards. Yeah. Did I hide it in the ground? Or did I multiply it? In my living a thank you life, for the Lord, I am going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. People don't like to hear that. But it doesn't matter because the Bible teaches it. Um, we're not talking about earning our salvation. You understand that? It's, it's about accountability before the Lord who saved us and what we did with this treasure of salvation. So, so here's how the people were thinking. You know, the, um, according to Paul's critics, Paul's gospel of justification by grace through faith without works would stimulate people to sin more than ever. In other words, grace alone is not a sufficient motivation for holy living. You must put people under the restraints of the law. If in Israel's story, the giving of the law led to an increase of sin and sin led to an increase of grace, then logically in our story, too, we should increase our sinning in order to give God the chance to increase his gracious forgiving. That's twisted. But that's what that's what's going on here. Ver, chapter six, verse one. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And the answer is, by no means. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's get into this now. And there's about seven or eight topics or major headings with regard to sanctification as we move through six, seven, and eight. So the first one is this, the, the ground of sanctification, the ground, the basis of sanctification. And that's in verses 2 through 10. Paul begins and says, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? We died to sin in the past. How can we live in it any longer in the future? By the way, it is not the literal impossibility of sin in believers which Paul is declaring. He's not saying that it's absolutely impossible for you now to sin. That's not what he's saying. It's not the literal impossibility of sin in believers, which Paul is declaring, but the moral absurdity, the inappropriateness of it. We died to sin. I'm going to explain what he means by that. We died to sin. How can we live any longer in it? It's absolutely absurd. It's inappropriate. Okay, that's what, that, that's what is being said there in that passage. So let's go ahead and read this. Let's just read it. We might. By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self 
was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death ha no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So that's an important verse, verse 10. But understanding verse 10 helps you understand what he means when he says you died to sin. Because Jesus Christ died to sin. Did you notice that? So it says the death he died, that Jesus died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So the fundamental fact is we died to sin in the past. How can we live in it any longer? Okay? Okay, let's, um, let's look at this a little bit more now. Um, what does we die to sin mean? Well, notice my note. I've kind of already touched on it. The expression die to sin or dead to sin occurs in this section twice of Christians. Verse 2 and verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. By the way, verse 11, in the same way, in the same way as what? Verse 10. The death that Jesus died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So, it, twice of Christians and once of Christ, to understand how we died to sin, we need to understand what Paul meant when he stated that Christ died to sin once for all. Okay, it cannot mean, what does that mean that Christ died to sin? It cannot mean that at some point Jesus became unresponsive or insensitive to sin. Because if it meant that, what would that imply? That, that, that at one time he was sensitive to it and responsive to it. So it can't mean, it's not, that's not what it means. This would imply that he had previously been re responsive or sensitive to it. That would be an intolerable slur on his character as the sinless son of God. The natural and obvious meaning of verse 10, the first part of it, is that Christ bore sin's condemnation, namely death. Right? He bore sin's condemnation, which is death. Death is sin's penalty. And through his substitutionary death on the cross, Jesus met sin's claim. And what is sin's claim? Death. Judgment. He paid its penalty. He accepted its reward. And he did it once for all. And so as a consequence, sin has no more claim or demand on him. So how do we know that? He rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. God raised him from the dead. This demonstrated how complete, how final, how decisive his sin-bearing sacrifice at the cross was. And he now lives forever to God. That's what it means that he died to sin once for all. Now, notice my second little statement there. What is true of Jesus is equally true of Christians who are united to Christ. We too have died to sin in Christ. We're in union with him. We, we too have died to sin in Christ. The score has been settled. The debt has been paid. The law has been satisfied. Our old life, that is what we were in Adam, has ended. I am a child of God. I'm part of a, I'm part of. God's new creation. So that's what, that's what we're talking about here when Paul says, 
Um, he asked the question, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? That's how people were thinking. By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? It's absurd, inappropriate. He's not saying it's impossible. <laughs> but it's not, it's not the way it ought to, should be. And it doesn't have to be. Okay, the, the other thing is, let's, let's try to get into this a little bit. When did we die to sin? Well, the answer is the moment you got saved, the moment you were born again. The moment you got saved, you were, you were joined in union with Jesus Christ, right? You were placed in his body. Our union with Christ was secured by our exercise of personal faith in Christ's finished work. And we're, we're baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, right? And how did we signify that? What, what, is the, what is the Christian way of signifying our union with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection? Baptism, right? So our union with Christ in his death and his resurrection was secured by our exercise of personal, personal faith in Christ's finished work and signified by means of water baptism by immersion. Now, I'm going to warn you, this passage is not teaching baptismal regeneration. Namely, that the mere immersion in water in the name of the Trinity automatically bestows salvation. The apostle neither believed this nor taught it, and the Bible doesn't. Salvation is by grace through faith in the work of Christ. However, we do know two things about water baptism. Um, and that is this. The New Testament never contemplates the abnormal situation of an unbaptized believer. The New Testament never even contemplates the abnormal situation of an unbaptized believer. Every believer was baptized. And by the way, right away. This idea that we get saved and then, you know, there's years and years go by and ah, I haven't decided whether I want to do that or not. Where does that come from? It assumes that those who are converted submit to baptism right away. That's why our Lord could speak of faith and baptism in the same breath. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Through, though baptism is not a requirement for salvation... It should be the invariable public sign of it. I got saved. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. And we signify in a public statement, in a public way, with our identification with Christ in his death to sin and in his resurrection to a new way and a commitment to a new life. And then second, another thing, it's not in your notes there, but in New Testament times, baptism so closely followed conversion that the two were considered part of one event. So although baptism is not a means by which we enter into a vital faith relationship with Jesus, it is closely associated with faith. Baptism depicts graphically what happens as a result of a Christian's union with Christ, which comes by grace through faith. Baptism signifies that we're dead to sin, but alive to God. So, that's, that's really kind of important, I think, to, to keep in mind. Um, so, when did we die to sin? Well, our union with Christ in his death and resurrection was secured by faith in Christ's finished work and signified by believers' water baptism by immersion. And that is the method that most water baptism by immersion is the method that most clearly symbolizes the reality, that, right? I mean, it most clearly symbolizes what baptism is about. It doesn't make it happen, but it certainly is a public and powerful statement of the fact that God has saved.
Does that make sense? Is that clear? That's what he's saying in this passage in, in chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. And that is that um, he's stating this fact, the ground of sanctification. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And we died to sin because, because Jesus died to sin once and for all, right? And when we believe, we are connected in union with Jesus Christ in his death to sin and his resurrection. So how can we continue to live in it any longer? It's absurd. It's inappropriate. Let's see, I'm trying to find that, that little thing here that I wanted to share with you. Um, maybe I, I don't know what I did here. Okay, well, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, we're going to get next into chapter 6, verses 11 through 23, the responsibility for sanctification. The responsibility for sanctification. And um, he begins to, to turn to that in chapter 6, verse 11. So in the same way, just as Christ died to sin once for all, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God. And we'll get into that next time we get together. Remember, that's not next week. All right, these are powerful, powerful things that believers need to understand. All right, praise the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that we here tonight name the name of Jesus Christ, that we've been saved. We've been bought and saved. We, we are your children. We are in union with, with, with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death to sin once for all and in his life to righteousness to holiness. So we pray, Lord, that we will continue to pursue holiness and growth and change. We've not arrived yet and we're to be pursuing these things for your glory. And that's what it means to live a thank you life. So we're grateful for these great truths tonight. And we ask your blessing. Keep everyone safe as we go to our homes tonight. May we be really careful. And we ask your blessing on the rest of the week. In Jesus' name, amen.